can see in the bottom here are some of the awards that he won. Famous guy, um, small in stature, but huge in his contribution to uh, the world. One of the things that many of you may not even know that you have is Arthur Schick's Haggadah with your Pesach material. And this particular one that you see here, we were able to um, see a similar one. There were only 240 of these uh, produced uh, approximately. They were all inscribed, produced in London in 1940. And when we went to see something you'll see in a second here about Arthur Schick in Cleveland, we were able to see the copy that was inscribed to Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver, who you know was a, a, a proponent of um, uh, looking out for Jewish people during the Second World War, and uh, also uh, a uh, Zionist, a proponent for uh, establishing a permanent Jewish homeland, which is now Israel. So this is; uh, these are very expensive. The one you see on the right, they could sell for forty or fifty thousand dollars. They're huge. The printing is magnificent. The artwork, but in Israel. In the 60s and 70s, there were numerous reproductions done, and that's what you see on the left. But you might want to double check. You may actually have on your bookshelf an Arthur Schick Haggadah. Very, very important. Um, the Haggadah, not only because of its, uh, of its magnificent artwork and the impact it had on, on, on Jewish satyrs, if you will, the Passover meal, um, it he was in London working on the uh, Haggadah in 1939 when the war broke out. And unfortunately, uh, his mother was still in Wich Poland and uh, did not survive, as we'll see later. But um, had he not been in London, I am sure that Arthur Schick probably would have perished in 1940, along with um, millions of others. In Cleveland at the temple, which has now moved out to the suburbs, it's a gorgeous building. Um, these are Arthur Schick windows. That's Gideon Sampson and Judah Maccabee done in stained glass. And below, I didn't, uh, the picture I took, I took this picture myself when we visited. Um, it's a uh, war memorial to Jewish war veterans from the Cleveland area. And in the chapel that's located next to this, um, the names of the servicemen and women that were killed in action uh, during World War II are actually their names are interwoven into the stained glass um, inside the chapel itself. It's quite remarkable. So let's take a look at Arthur Schick. You see him on the left, uh, smoker, and uh, some of his interesting works. Um, on the top center there, that is his Declaration of Independence of the United States. And I think, I can't see behind me now because I'm looking at the screen, you will see a colotype print, very, very rare of that, hanging on the wall behind me. The original is actually in the uh, Library of Congress. And below that, in the center by his arm, is the Declaration of Independence for the State of Israel. And we have that also as a, um, a really beautiful lithograph here at the house. And almost everything you see in this presentation is part of our Arthur Schick collection. So um, take a look at Arthur Schick with his wife and daughter. And this is when they showed up in Canada. And in 1940, in the summer of 1940, he left England and he did exhibits in Canada and then came down to the United States and uh, uh, lived the remainder of his life in New Canaan, Connecticut. And we, we thought we would have an opportunity to meet his daughter, uh, Alexandra, but uh, unfortunately, uh, she was in Florida at the time. We, were, we had two exhibits of his artwork, uh, one at the New Britain Museum of American Art in New Canaan and in New Britain, Connecticut, and one at the University of Hartford. And uh, unfortunately, she was not there. She has since passed away too. Um, this is an important book if, if from our collection. This is a, uh, in 1939, the, the World's Fair was going on in New York City. And uh, this is, a, uh, there was a Jewish Palestine pavilion. Uh, the, actually, uh, Einstein actually attended that there at the opening. But this is uh, the Polish pavilion actually published the catalog uh, prior to World War II starting on September 1st of 1939. This is an insert, uh, pardon me, these are pages from the catalog. Arthur Schick was actually exhibiting in the Polish pavilion at the New York World's Fair in 1939 as you can see here. Now, I just added this to my presentation. Please note that um, it says item number 15. 
the founding of the settlement of Panamaria Mar in Texas. And I had never heard of that until Arthur, uh, until you study Arthur Schick. And this is a uh, actual illustration of a famous Polish general. Thaddeus is a uh, uh, Polish general and also a general under George Washington in our own, um, in the American Revolution as well. And he focused on a lot of these famous Polish patriots that also like he did, became a, a patriot here in the United States. But what I wanted to really show you is this, this is Panna Maria. It is the oldest permanent Polish settlement in America is right outside of San Antonio. And I'll bet you a whole bunch of people on this did not know that. And we all live here in Texas. It was established in 1854. And this is a reproduction on a series of postcards of, a, of famous works that Arthur Schick did. These postcards are from 1939. And he already knew about the Poles living in America well prior to his coming here. Um, these were done in the 30s. And uh, a, a fascinating piece of Arthur Schick, uh, Texas and Polish history. Um, it's part of a series of cards that came with this. This was the um, uh, glorious days of the Polish American fraternity. And the cards, the 20 postcards came in this envelope with a, um, a little information sheet. Of course, these are uh, scanned directly from our collection. These were so popular that they were actually reproduced in 1976 for the um, uh, for the our, our own bicentennial here. And uh, again, I just I scanned only the um, uh, Panna uh, Maria uh, card from from 1939. It was reproduced here. So a little piece of Arthur Schick, Texas history as well. Arthur Schick was no, no stranger to war. He was a veteran of the Polish army in World War I. And um, you, it's interesting, this is one of the oldest originals. This is from 1915, uh, very early Arthur Schick work. And you can see the Polish uniform and uh, the hat and the soldier. Um, he was always very much into uh, military, and uh, caring about his own military, as you'll see, it, it carried on not only from the American Revolution and, and onward. This is one of my favorite, favorite pieces that he did. This is uh, Joseph Trumpledore, uh, a veteran of the um, uh, First World War with the British who lost his arm. You'll see his arm is missing in this. And uh, the 19, and at the Battle of Tel Hai, in uh, Israel, I guess what was then Palestine. This is Arthur Schick's rendition of Joseph Trumpledore uh, leading the, um, uh, the, the Jewish people at Tel Hai um, um, in, in that particular battle. So he says, if I am not for me, if, if I am not for, or um, well, you can read that as well as I can. So anyway, uh, some of the other things that I'd like to show you are the magnificent works he did in the 1920s. When he was in Paris, he published um, books and illustrated books for others. The one on the left, which is kind of an art deco-y look, is uh, The Well of Jacob. And we have not that one. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the original one we have from the book, the uh, book plates. But it's remarkable, his style. It's a very unique um, you know, miniaturistic style. And on the right, here's another piece from the, um, uh, from the 1920s. And what I find remarkable about a lot of this is that they were able to print the magnificent colored uh, illustrations that this, that this artist did. And you notice in there, it's very detailed. Uh, the one on the right, um, I forgot if that one's from, um, 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 Flaubert's Temptation of St. Anthony or not. I, I forgot which one that's, that's from. But one of the most important works he did is the Statues of Kalitsky. And this is really important because in 1264, uh, Prince uh, Bolonov the Pious, he actually did a, gave, granted, it's like the Magna Carta for Jewish people in Poland, if you will. Jewish people, in 1264 gained rights of other citizens and gained the protection of the government against the desecration of Jewish cemeteries and synagogues. And as you know, as we 
look at and remember Kristallnacht today, it, uh, from the 9th and the 10th. Um, it, it, it turns out it would have been nice if other countries may have done that as well. Uh, perhaps the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. But this is an important series of uh, paintings and drawings that he did. Here's a uh, larger uh, image of this. And although we don't own any of the originals, we do own a complete set of incredibly reproduced lithographs from Poland uh, of this kind of artwork. And what he's done is taken the statute and uh, uh, turned it into something that's very important for um, to remember of how in Poland at one time, the Jews were well treated. And I suspect that's why there was probably the largest population in Europe was located in Poland. Uh, Arthur Schick, uh, the General Council of, uh, uh, of Poland in Canada said, when studying the beauty and the greatness of Arthur Schick, you will have sight of the inner world of the artist. You will learn of his amazing knowledge of the history of nations, races and personalities, and of his meticulous thought, thoroughness, his nature, and last but not least of the spirit which has animated his works. And this again is, uh, that's the original he's doing of the uh, Declaration of Independence of the United States. So this is um, uh, what we have at our home. It's beautiful, it's huge, and uh, the writing, the calligraphy is all done by him and, Art, and George Washington and other American patriots feature very heavily in all of his uh, artwork. Now, this is really, this is from the same series of uh, a card, or this is from a different series of cards. This is from 1932. Uh, he was a self-described soldier in art. He was a committed activist artist advocating religious tolerance and religious equality for minorities, including Jewish people certainly, but also very heavily uh, in support of African Americans. Now, I don't know if anybody would recognize, this is the, uh, his rendition um, uh, at the battle at Concord Bridge, right? The very opening of the American Revolution. Now, if you notice, there's an, a, a black man lying wounded, fortunately he did not perish, on the uh, bridge. That is Prince Estabrook, a slave to the Estabrook family of Massachusetts who asked to fight with the militia, not to gain, not as a condition of freedom, but because he, because he thought that he had a chance of really doing well here in America. And if we were all freed uh, at some point of even British rule, his, his lot uh, would become better. He eventually did become a free man, but Arthur Schick in the early 1930s knew about Prince Estabrook, the history of America and our revolution. And when I speak to thousands of school kids on a normal year, not uh, this year, unfortunately, but, um, and we talk about different things, almost no one knows who Prince Estabrook was, but that's the detail with which um, Arthur Schick um, uh, knew American history. So Arthur Schick says, the origin of all art is what we call propaganda. The art of Egypt, Greece, Rome, the Renaissance was the propaganda of religion. I do not say that art is my aim, but art is my means. And as you can see here, he's showing all the mumsarium from uh, uh, all over the excess powers, including the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, you see on the far left there with the kind of fez on that work very closely with Hitler and came out with the uh, Hanchar division, the only non-Aryan um, division in the SS were Bosnian Muslims who uh, went through the Balkans with, um, with great fervor and murdered uh, uh, thousands and thousands of Jews throughout the Balkan area. But you can see all of them, you've got Franco there. And what do you notice there? It's a map and it's titled The Map Maker. Um, and it shows, uh, you know, basically Hitler taking over the world to the Nazis. And that's from 1944. This is a beautiful photo of Arthur Schick creating St. George slaying the Nazi dragon. So prior to the United States entry into World War II, Arthur Schick was a proponent of certainly supporting Britain. And the British American Ambulance Corps, that's a, a poster stamp. Um, that you see at the bottom, a reproduction from his original artwork, 
um, that was used as fundraising for the British American Ambulance Corps. He worked very closely with Eleanor Roosevelt um, in trying to raise money and awareness of the plight of the Brits um, to um, uh, being, you know, the United States supporting them. And it's, it's really quite a, uh, quite a piece of telling artwork. Um, um, and he also did, this is another interesting thing about the same time, this is 1942, um, FDR gave the famous Four Freedom speech. And everybody or many people know of Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms. He did a painting and it was a big to do. Arthur Schick actually did a series of Four Freedom drawings prior to Norman Rockwell. And this is one of them. This is the Freedom from Fear. Look at the gorgeous artwork. And um, it's kind of like Sir Lancelot, you know, uh, um, just battling. But notice the shield now. The shield is, a, is an American uh, emblem, uh, not British, not anyone else. Now he's, uh, he's taken the, the, the American cause, if you will, even on the horse, his head and breastplate. So now let's get into some of his early artwork. In 1939, when he was still in London, this is an original from the collection. Um, this is called Der Herrenvolk, and that's uh, the, the warlord. So you can see these are guys more from the, uh, um, you know, the aristocracy, not necessarily the SS or Hitler's brown shirts. This is the old German guard, and he calls them the warlords. This is how he started getting. And, and one of the things I think I'd like to point out as we go through this, and some of these we'll have to go through quickly for the time allotted, is notice how his style changes from the 19 teens through the, the 20s, the beautiful work he did in Paris, through the war and, and after, the short time after. So this is one um, that was on exhibit at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. I tracked it down and bought it from uh, two brothers out in, uh, in, in California. This is a very interesting painting also done in London in 1939 of basically, it's not Stalin, but it's, you know, the Soviets uh, courting the, uh, the Poles and Hitler looking on going, hmm, what's this all about? So uh, as you know, in September, on September 1st to 39, the Nazis invaded from the West. And a few days later, a week later, the Soviets invaded Poland from the uh, East. And I like this because now, now Arthur Schick is, uh, has arrived in Canada. And so he goes to, he, he does this one in Ottawa. And it's really a wonderful drawing because now he's incorporating the, um, uh, the, the Canadian Mounties uh, in, into the uh, uh, fight against the Nazis. And wait, just wait a minute, he tells this guy as he uh, you know, goes to give him a good slug and a kisser there. Uh, and one of the other things you'll notice in all his artwork is done in gouache, it's watercolor and gouache. And uh, he, notice the boots, it's always an interesting boots and the hands. Boots and hands are always seems to be larger than life for some reason, I'm not sure why. And this is another one we have, this, the, these uh, images were on exhibit up at McGill University in Montreal a number of years ago. Um, this, this was done in Ottawa in 1940, but they had sent a lot of, um, um, German prisoners of war um, to Canada. Many came later after the, uh, the US um, beat Rommel in, in North Africa, especially in the Tunisian campaign. There were hundreds of thousands were sent to North America, mostly many of them actually here to Texas. Anyway, in, 19, um, in 1940 or 41, he came out with a book. This is prior to the US entry into the war called The New Order. And it was a compilation of his works, uh, his anti-Nazi, anti-access works. That's a copy of the book. And this is an original from that book um, that hangs above uh, my grandmother's piano in our living room uh, downstairs. And this is an Italian fighter. And uh, he's showing him as a, uh, you know, part of the access, well, of course, wearing the swastika, not just the, um, uh, not just his Italian uniform. Notice again, the boots and the hands. This one is uh, from uh, also from Ottawa, 1940, and this one is from the book, and they sit side by side. When you open the book, one is on the left, one is on the right. It's an incredible opportunity. I was able to find these, and it says, "Can't you see I'm busy?" So that's a British soldier, um, you know, kicking the Italian away from the back while he's fighting the Nazi in the front. And uh, these are very, 
very chilling paintings. Uh, you can see the um, how he always makes the caricatures of the Nazis, always making them look very demonic, which is probably accurate. Anyway, this is another one we have. And this one actually, uh, this is the original framed, um, you can see the shadow of me taking a picture of it the other day. This ran as an article in Collier's Magazine, and that's the edition of Collier's, and this is what it looks like inside. So it's always nice when you have original artwork, um, when you can find where it ran and how it was used. Again, it was used to illustrate an article um, about, I think it was the uh, Nazis in Finland. And you can see the um, Soviet or the uh, communist patch on, on the, um, on the, fi the uh, partisan fighters. So this is one of his uh, most famous drawings. So now, now America gets into the war. And this ran, the original of this ran in Esquire magazine. He did a lot in Esquire. And they produced a series of postcards, six postcards of this. This was one of the postcards. And we'll show some of those later. But this is right after the Japanese uh, surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. So you see the iconic American cowboy figure and the Japanese, uh, you know, the Tojo guy uh, stabbing America in the back. And there you see Mussolini and Hitler off in the back corner, kind of like, wow, what the heck happened here? So uh, trying to figure out where they all go from here. And as you know, the, that's uh, shortly after uh, the surprise attack in, in, at Pearl Harbor, the US entered the war against not only Japan, but uh, all the excess powers. So uh, now, now Schick turns his, 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 um, his energy towards, you know, what is it like for Americans here, Jews and, and people of color, if you will. So here he shows, not only are American as fighting men and women, but Americans behind the war effort. So notice the man on the right, um, he has a Mogan David, a Star of David, a Jewish star on his uh, uh, pocket cover. And of course you see a, a black man to the left. So this is showing that regardless of who you were, people were all in the war effort, in this case, building a tank. Very important him to be inclusive and to give that image. This is a, uh, another lithograph that we have. I don't know where the original is of this, but this once again shows Jewish men and women as fighting. You see, this, the, um, uh, you see the soldier, the sailor, the uh, airman. Um, there's a whack and a wave. If you see the, the women in the back behind the, um, uh, the airmen in the center of that, and then notice also um, the, uh, uh, the men and women building a, uh, a, a machine gun at the bottom. So this was really critical to his artwork, um, it be, making sure, and note the helmet on the soldier. That appears somewhere else. I'll show you. It's a very interesting thing. But, you know, the guy had to make a living. So not only did his artwork appear with, um, you know, a, as a uh, illustration to complement somebody's article in a magazine, but he, you'll see he did many covers of magazines and so on. He also did regular commercial art. So this was, um, uh, he did a series of two posters for Wyatt Pharmaceuticals in 1942. That's now part of Pfizer. And this was, uh, um, these were, you know, to prevent venereal disease. And look at these caricatures of Hitler, Tojo, and uh, Mussolini. I mean, this is really graphic stuff. And these were, uh, we have, these are full-size posters that hung in businesses and medical offices and so on, and especially in barracks and other places in the military. Uh, venereal disease was a really serious concern and took an awful lot of uh, men out of, uh, out of combat uh, because they were ill. And this is the other one. It says, but prophylaxis prevents disease. American soldier could catch it with ease. So again, kind of almost like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. But this is another full-size poster in our collection. And uh, notice Mussolini there with no pants on. <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, this, I, this is the only one of these I've ever seen. It's in our collection. It's on thick cardboard. It's been partially restored on the left. But this is a Bromo Seltzer window display for drugstores back in the day. It says for quick relief uh, from those headaches, and he shows just Hitler and, uh, and Tojo in this one, uh, buy that extra war bond. And so, you know, he was paid to do these and uh, people love seeing this stuff. It was really, really serious, powerful propaganda. 
um, he did this particular one for Coca-Cola. So these are, um, uh, it's, it looks like American troops, it's uh, most likely British, but it's, uh, or forming friendships in what was then Palestine, 1943. So um, kind of an interesting look. Margie, you might like that. You notice the towers and all so on in the, uh, and the kibbutz in the background and notice the little shul on the hill with the Mogan David on top on the, on the back uh, right hand side of the screen. It's really quite nice. So he did, uh, asbestos was uh, really in demand as you can imagine during the war and the asbestos association, um, they really did not, uh, they were really good unlike some of the oil companies and others. Um, they were really good about making sure none of this stuff got overseas to support the um, uh, enemy, even during uh, as America was getting ready to enter the war. And he did a whole series of these ads uh, for the asbestos people. And, and again, they're, they're quite, um, quite chilling. And uh, what you'll also see is how images were used multiple times. He sold the rights to the uh, piece in the center to North American. It's North American Aviation. And uh, uh, that became North American Rockwell, which is Rockwell International today. And as you see, there's the, the, the three uh, access leaders. And then um, they gave the rights because they bought it. They bought the artwork. They gave the rights to this music company to cut out um, Tojo and uh, Hoagie Carmichael. Put that on they put that on sheet music from Hoagie Carmichael. Another one, uh, and we have a number of uh, what's called Jap hunting licenses that came out after Pearl Harbor. There's one on a pin that shows Arthur Schick's illustration, keep them dying, no limit. You know, like there's uh, limits if you're hunting and so on, uh, if you have a hunting license. Uh, we have a number of these on exhibit at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum as we speak. It's been there for a while. But notice again, there's the cover of, um, uh, of a War Department pamphlet, two down and one to go. So uh, the war in Japan, it's uh, in, in May, the war ends in Europe and now we're still fighting and they, they use that as a um, kind of a, a anti-Japanese cover, if you will. And that also appears on a very rare copy that a friend of mine in Japan sent me uh, of uh, Arthur, uh, a famous book on Arthur Schick written in Japanese. So it's interesting how his uh, one illustration appears in many, many different venues. One of his most famous covers for, is on Time Magazine of Admiral Yamamoto. And you may know that Admiral Yamamoto was the mind and the brains and the, uh, the, the, the real force behind the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, it, it's a brilliant cover and um, shows him quite well. Uh, he did covers for lots of magazines. Some of my favorites are Collier's. And on the one year anniversary or a one year and a week roughly, um, this is the anniversary edition on the left of the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor. Look at that illustration of Tojo as a bat with the bomb. It, it's, it's spectacular. And these, these magazines, if you can find them, sell for quite a bit of money. We have the whole series. Um, that's some of the other ones are on the uh, bottom right. But in Austin, many of you won't know this, we have a Congress Street Bridge, it goes over the lake here, and it's noted for having millions of bats. And it's it personally, I find it kind of disgusting because it really smells down there. But at night, people come from all over and when it's sundown, the bats all come out to feed, feed on the mosquitoes and what have you. And millions of them come out from under the bridge. And what's really interesting is someone put the cachet on that first day of issue, United States stamp cover canceled here in Austin, Texas, where the bat stamps were released in 2002. I thought that was a really neat connection, another connection to uh, Texas, Arthur Schick, and specifically to Austin. We don't have every single one of these, but we do have most of these. And uh, these are just some of the covers of, uh, of magazines and various publications where Arthur Schick's work appeared. And these were, he was paid for this. Um, you can see on Answer Magazine, the, uh, his battle at Tell High in the top center. Um, and notice the Children's Digest in the very bottom left, uh, right rather, the bottom right, that's gonna come into play a little bit later. So this is one that I'm looking at right here from my desk. Uh, this is Hermann Goering, the head of the, uh, Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, 
And that's a famous little painting of his where it's hard to see when it's blown up, but that's a Royal Air Force insignia on the little airplane. And what that signifies is uh, uh, the, the British before the United States entered the war kind of holding out and standing up against the Nazis. It's, a, um, it, it's a, a quite an quite a interesting painting. This one is one of my favorites. And this is a very large painting for Arthur Schick. Many of his things, as you know, he was a miniaturist. This is a fairly large piece hanging in our home here. And it's entitled Panama. And the reason I put the American Mercury there is because this painting appears in, American, in the American Mercury magazine in black and white uh, in an article about this. And the reason these guys, including Francisco Franco from Spain in the front there with the other um, um, access powers, they were always trying to get the Panama Canal. And it was obviously a, a, a very essential waterway and critical to the defense of, of, of the uh, Western Hemisphere. And uh, in the background there, you see an American soldier and sailor and the ships, the battleships behind there with a word that says Panama on the sign. And uh, so this is kind of a chilling deal. There's a lot to this. And if you notice, um, look at the, um, uh, the horse that Mussolini is on. Um, the back end looks more like a pig's tuchus than it does a horse. So I, I think there's some symbolism there. And, uh, or he may be in fact riding a, a pig. Um, but most importantly, look at Fr Francisco Franco leading uh, Hitler's horse. You can't see it, but the book he's carrying says Sein Kampf, not Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf is my struggle or my battle. Sein Kampf is your battle. So he's, he's carrying a copy of, hey, I'm leading you, but this is your struggle, not mine. And then notice he has one rein in his hand near his rifle, but look at the other rein. It's a noose around his neck that basically uh, Hitler's got him fully under control. There's two interesting paintings that I have here in my office. No one has ever been able to translate uh, nobody knows what that is. I've had some experts look at it. Nobody seems to know. I think that may be just something he made up. If anybody knows what that is, please let me know, because I've been unable for years to find out. But there's two paintings here that we have the originals of. And the thing I like to point out is they're both, uh, you know, like partisans. And uh, on this one, it says death to the traitors in, uh, in, in French. And this is from 1944. But what you'll notice is always on the weapons, in this particular case, the machine guns, everything always says made in the USA. He was very emphatic about showing that uh, the USA was supporting everyone from the partisans on, uh, on up. So um, it, it, they're fascinating uh, uh, images, characterizations of uh, partisans and uh, them defeating. This, this is actually a really cool drawing. Um, we have this original with that, as you see, that's an original clip, uh, 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 little article from the New York Times that was his inspiration for drawing this. And you notice these old German men in Teutonic and Napoleonic era uniforms, they were raiding museums and having old men and kids, everybody to arms towards the end of the war. And this is his rendition of what they would look like after they went through taking stuff from museums. And this is a book uh, for uh, Arthur Schick did 1000 copies of this uh, were, were issued all inscribed to people. They were pre-ordered called Ink and Blood. And once again, it's just, this was done after the war. It's a compilation of, of so many of his magnificent works, even pastings in this particular book. And I, we've owned a number of copies. I think we may have one or two left, but we've donated, uh, I think, a copy of this, I know for sure, to the Holocaust Museum in Dallas, and I believe one in, uh, at the Holocaust Museum in Houston as well. It's a, it's a wonderful compilation. All of them are signed by Arthur Schick, and um, uh, th this illustration is contained in that. This is another famous one that appears in this particular issue of American Mercury, and you see that the um, uh, Soviet goes, give me a hand, somebody that uh, um, in, you know, in the uh, Eastern area, uh, trying to keep the Nazis outside. And notice the Nazi is now a skeleton. They're always delivering death. So, um, um, and, and you'll notice also, it says courtesy of uh, American Mercury Magazine at the bottom. That was on there when I bought it. 
So here's another one we have. This is almost on a piece of board. It's, it's heavier than cardboard. And this is Arthur Schick's rendition of the, uh, that's a Norwegian flag. And uh, uh, the Norwegian army uh, or soldier in this case, uh, you know, rounding up Hitler. And this is an original wire photo on the right that's also in our collection of Arthur Schick painting the, uh, the drawing that we have in our collection. I thought that was a really neat way to match it up. So I put those together for you. And as, as you know, wire photos were photos that were transmitted over the air and actually developed as a picture or as a photograph for the newspapers and magazines to be able to use them in their various publications. So now Arthur Schick has tried to bring to light what was going on, the plight of the Jewish people. And like most people that tried to help, it was basically unsuccessful. And so now you've got genocide, the, the, the greatest genocide in, in, in mankind. I doubt if this could ever be, I hope to God it never be replicated. 1.5 million Jewish children murdered, four and a half million adults, millions, countless millions of other minorities and so on. And, and, and this is what people saw afterwards. The picture on the right, from our collection, that's Fritz. These, these were this is from Bergen Belsen. It was liberated by the British. That's Fritz Klein, the doctor from Bergen Belsen. In the middle, they were making all these uh, female camp guards, um, you know, bury the uh, uh, the remains of their Jewish victims here, Jews and others. So, I want you to keep that in mind because as we go forward now, we're going to roll back to 1925 Paris but I wanna show you the impact of the Holocaust in World War II on Arthur Schick. This is the Megillah Esther, the Book of Esther, uh, published in Paris in 1925. It's spectacular. It's miniature, magnificent artwork. Now, um, notice that you see there, there's King Ahasuerus, you have Queen Esther, you have Mordecai, kind of the head of state, and notice way off in the distance who's hanging out there. Well, there's a guy named Haman or Haman, and he was the guy, the, the, the chief of staff, if you will, for the king. And he tried to do what Hitler and his henchmen succeeded in doing was to annihilate the Jewish people in, in his kingdom. Well, it all got turned around and many of us know the story of Esther and Haman and his brothers that were all plotting with him ended up being hung instead of uh, Esther and Mordecai and, and the rest of the Jewish people. And this book is so beautifully illustrated, it's, uh, it's magnificent. So after the war in 1950, the year before Schick passed away, he does, he does, redoes the book of Esther. And notice the whole difference. Look at the difference in the style. It still has that nice kind of, uh, um, medieval manuscripty kind of border around, if you will, and the beautiful um, um, kind of like the Ethiopian lions, the lions of Judah at the bottom. But look at him. First of all, Arthur Schick has inserted himself sitting in the chair writing um, uh, the text. And where's Haman? Haman is now a Nazi. Look at the swastikas on the slippers, on the, sh on the sash and the skull on the sh sash. Um, and, and he's actually holding, you have to look at the symbolism here, he's holding a hamantaschen. Many times hamantaschen are, uh, was known as a, uh, 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 Haman's ear. So he's doing, you can read the text here, who, he who saves his nation Israel from all their tormentors. Uh, the script from the, Mag the Megillah, the book of Esther translates, and they hanged Haman on, on the tree with which he, Haman, had prepared for Mordecai. Well, they don't have him on a tree. They have him on a gallows like you'd see at a, uh, at a death camp. And uh, just a remarkable sy uh, symbolism here. And the anger of the king was abated. And of course, uh, at the bottom in Hebrew, uh, uh, the Megillah Esther. So it's uh, uh, notice the shin on the uh, books uh, the, next to the writing that Arthur Schick is doing and so on and all his uh, uh, drawing utensils there. Just remarkable. This is the same story, the same Hebrew text. And now look at the difference in the artwork. 
And personally, I think he was unable to do that kind of artwork after the Holocaust. But what he did do was other interesting things. So this is, um, uh, this is Saul Bloom, a famous, famous congressman from New York. So uh, Saul Bloom, instead of photographs, Arthur Schick did his uh, little uh, lithographs for him. You see George Washington in the back. And, um, um, uh, and Saul Bloom was responsible for the US government sesquicentennial celebration of George Washington, as I think why George Washington's in the back there. But Saul Bloom would use these uh, to send to Sarah Rosen and other constituents that were looking for his autograph. Uh, Senator Guy Gillette uh, from uh, Iowa, it's really remarkable the lovely relationship that he had with uh, numerous people that were very supporters of um, what became Israel. And look at this letter that we have in our collection. God bless you both, love and kisses from the Schick family, your devoted friend, Arthur. And uh, these, these are just speak volumes to the, to the reach that Arthur Schick had in his defense calling people to help support the Jewish people of Europe, although it felt like, as we know, it, it wasn't so successful, but to fight the Lindberghs and the uh, uh, Charles Coughlin, the, the Catholic priest from Michigan and so on, all these anti-Semites and isolationists. They, he, he did a remarkable job as a guy that's not very well known today. This is a um, very interesting little piece that we found uh, in, a, in a little collection I bought not too long ago. It's called The Eternal Light. It's from 1952, uh, about four months after he died, they actually, they actually presented and put in print an interview that obviously happened prior to September of, of 1951. And there's two things that I, uh, I found very interesting here. He writes, uh, this is a this specific interview. He writes on the left side, in March of 1943, my beloved 70-year-old mother, Eugenia uh, Schick, was taken from the ghetto in, of, uh, of Woods to the Nazi furnaces of Majdanek. Uh, with her voluntarily went her faithful servant, the good Christian Josefa, a, a Polish peasant. Together, hand in hand, they were bur burned alive. In memory of the two noble martyrs, I dedicate my pictures of the Bible as an eternal cottage for their great souls. I mean, think about this. Think about the impact of this guy's life and what went on in Europe while he, he managed to survive. And then on the other right-hand side, uh, somebody writes, as he's remembered the tragedy of the recent past and looked across the Atlantic to the tragedy of the present, he made another dedication. A, de a dedication to his energies to the cause of Jewish Palestine. His friends, though, uh, his friends thought too much of his energy, energy was going into this struggle. So Mary says, Arthur, you're doing too much. Every time I pick up an appeal for Palestine, I see your work. Julia says gently, his wife, Arthur always says yes. It's a bad habit, Mary. Mary, but there's a limit, Arthur, to the work you can do. Pay attention to this line. Arthur, the Jews in Europe think there should be a limit to their suffering too, but there isn't. So think about this stuff, what was going on in his mind and his paintings when he was doing this kind of work. Now, for some reason, I am, oh, there we go. Let me go back one and make sure, okay. So um, in, in addition to his um, work for Palestine, this is dated 1949, but prior to this, he designed the stationary logo uh, for the red Mogendovid uh, uh, for Palestine, which is basically a, a red cross like, like organization. Um, that was, there was a lot of political stuff with the red cross at that time. And maybe there still is, I'm not hundred percent sure of that. But uh, anyway, that's Arthur Schick's logo up on the top there, um, uh, showing a, uh, a Jewish woman, a nurse, uh, comforting a, um, a Jewish soldier in Palestine at that time. His work appeared everywhere. And in uh, 1951, prior to his passing, um, he, did, uh, he did a tremendous number of philatelic items, uh, stamps for Israel, stamps for Liberia, postage stamps. So he did these, um, um, uh, 
frontispieces for the what was supposed to be a complete set, but unfortunately passed away in the process of all the uh, country, countries that were members of the then United Nations uh, early on. And uh, you can see the different ones there where he was sitting signing those um, for people to purchase. And I found these uh, philatelic covers. One's a Hanukkah stamp from 2002 where they use the Israel one um, and another one where they used the Switzerland one that he designed uh, as one of the philatelic covers. This is something you won't see very often and, and very few collections would have anything like this. George Schick in the original photo I forgot to mention when we first started, when you saw the picture of Arthur and his wife and, and daughter, uh, it mentioned that George Schick, his son, stayed in England and was going to work with the French resistance um, during World War II, which he did and he survived the war. Unfortunately, and I have no, I cannot seem to find out why or how George Schick died at a very young age in 1958, I believe it is 41 years old. However, look at the date on this letter. It is three days before the passing of his father and it's signed George Schick and I copied the back and the front of the envelope here so you could see it. It's actually postmarked two days before Arthur died and uh, you notice he typed in George Schick above Arthur Schick on the pre-printed stationery there. And what's fascinating is the letter says, I want to inform you that the Children's Digest for October will have a cover made by Mr. Arthur Schick. I thought you would like to, uh, to know this. And we, of course, happen to have a very, very, very rare copy of this Children's Digest from October of 1951. So the fact that we have anything signed uh, by George Schick is extremely rare because he just um, wasn't around a lot. Um, this is one page from an article I had published about Arthur Schick and it shows some of the poster stamps that people would purchase to raise money for various causes. And the one in the green uh, above the Exodus in Mayflower where you see the Mogan, Mogan David, um, that is a Jewish fighter from his series for Passover. That's the wise son. As you can see, uh, my grandmother used to call me a chacham, um, but uh, it was meant to be differently. I think she meant it as a wise guy, and this is a wise son. I think that this, this particular term is being used <laughs> a little more affectionately. But notice the wise son has a helmet, somebody to defend himself. And these were the American Federation to... Um, uh, uh, to say uh, to save for, for Polish Jews, emergency committee to save the Jews of, of Europe and so on. And you see on the left, those are signed stamps he did for the state of Israel for their festival series. And I just uh, enlarged a sheet. That's how they would come in booklets of the various um, images that would show up on these uh, fundraising labels that he did. This, uh, this just showed up. A friend of mine uh, sent this to me from Poland. Um, this is a 1987 magazine that was started in the 1930s by a couple of uh, left-wing Jewish guys in, uh, in Poland. It was a satire magazine, and uh, it went out of business during the war and came back after the war, and I think went out of business again in 1994, maybe. But this is a 1987. I don't know how many of these could exist. It's on kind of junky paper and stuff, but this is what the centerfold and I've only owned this probably for um, a week and a couple of days. Look at the illustrations, his early illustrations is why I'm showing this from the 1920s, almost like stick figures. And you can see there's one from 1940, I think it is in the top left, a, um, um, a self-portrait of Arthur Schick up there. So this is really interesting. And you can see they have a little biography of him. It's all in Polish but uh, from 1894 to 1951, the years he was uh, uh, of, of, of his life. So I thought this was interesting that even in Poland in the 1980s, his work is still um, uh, uh, showing up. So I wanted to end on this. Um, you know, we have lost the most articulate witness to history's greatest crime. And this is about Elie Wiesel, but I think it applies to uh, Arthur Schick as well. Without these kinds of men in the world, it's up to every one of us to now to stand up to the deniers. With his passing or with their passing, we will all have to work a little harder because we will no longer have Ellie, Arthur Schick and others to remind us of what happened when the world is silent and indifferent to evil. 
It is now our job and that of our children and grandchildren, you know, the door of the door, right? To pick up the baton and to relay Ellie's message of hope and peace to the world. And that's from Ronald Lauder. And uh, we had a chance to sit and have dinner with him one time in uh, Philadelphia. It was really an honor and quite a guy. But I'd like to kind of end with that. And uh, if there's time left um, to answer any questions that anyone may have or any comments that anyone would have. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I hope if nothing else, somebody may have learned a little something and um, maybe been touched on a way that all of us can do a little better and uh, maybe a little more kindness in this day and age and always. So thank you very much. Beautiful, Greg, thank you so much. And uh, what, what a great image to end with. We're counting on you that, that, we, that we continue to be the light and especially the, the work about his life published shortly after his death called The Eternal Light, which is also the Ner Tamid, the eternal light, the flame that continues to light, which is why we have, uh, we name our award after that as well. And so we're just really delighted to be able to learn about this wonderful beacon of light, Arthur Schick. Um, so if, uh, what about, um, do you, do you did you want to comment about some about any of the other Polish artists? I uh, anyone else who we might have heard of or not heard of? I uh, what you know one one artist that I think is very fascinating, not Polish, but uh, Theodore Geisel. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but Dr. Seuss was a very powerful anti-Nazi uh, cartoonist and artist in the day. You have to unmute, Greg. So uh, pardon me, but I, I think you hit uh, kind of a really good nerve for me because why don't we schedule our Dr. Seuss presentation for the next one then? Uh -huh. We have a very large Dr. Seuss Theodore Geisel connection, uh, collection rather, and I have a, uh, I've given it numerous times. We've actually exhibited our, um, our Dr. Seuss material in various museums and universities on numerous occasions. Um, uh, it's, it's powerful. I mean, and I do Dr. Seuss, the collection is Dr. Seuss, I call it wartime and before. So it's not, um, you know, the cat in the hat kind of stuff. It's his work when he was a major in the U.S. Army. It's his works uh, uh, from World War II and shortly after um, when he was a, um, uh, he and his wife Helen were also script writers, not just, um, uh, not just uh, cartoonists, but we have, uh, uh, we have original uh, Dr. Seuss material, his drawings. So one is a 1942 political cartoon in our collection. It's powerful. So yeah, absolutely. Now he's not Jewish. So sometimes uh, people like us they depend on the group, but um, I've given that, uh, that thing to the University of Texas and many, many organizations for a number of years. I did not know you collected his art. You are truly a man of heart. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, really some interesting stuff. Uh, regarding Dr. Seuss, he uh, did a lot of work uh, for Esso Oil, which is uh, kind of fun. And actually, the University of Texas has a lot of that stuff here in Austin, but we also have a lot of it here. Uh, and he, he worked for, um, uh, did work for all sorts of magazines, uh, um, you know, in, in the day, you know, in the, in the 30s and 20s and so on. It's, it's really fun stuff. You ever see Flit, the um, insecticide? It was like DDT in a can. You know, he did stuff for that. And um, yeah, it's just really remarkable. They had the Seuss Navy. As a matter of fact, this is a, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I have some coins in here, but this is a Dr. Seuss. It's called the Nuzzle Pus Ashtray. Can you see it clear or no? And it's a seal. And um, this was part of the Seuss Navy for SO Marine products. And um, it's, it's an actual ashtray. Whoop, gotta go this way. So that's just, uh, and these are pretty rare. We have, they have two of them. <laughs> but uh, a lot of great shit stuff, or Seuss stuff. So yeah, yeah does anybody else have a, a particular artist they like? We might, you know, I, we collect, I just gave a, a presentation um, to the University of Texas just a week or so ago on uh, uh, American cartoonists on the front line. And it's about Disney, Milton Caniff, Dave Breger, uh, Reg Manning, Rube Goldberg, uh, all these guys. So we, we could, 
you know, it's uh, we have a, quite a propaganda collection there. Terrific. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned Esso. That is, uh, you know, our synagogue is in Humble, Texas. Oh, right. Which Humble was oil. which was part of part yep. of Esso or Humble Oil and and now Exxon Mobil. Um, if I could just make one quick comment, my my, fir, my friend Irv Osser from uh, Ottawa, Canada, joined us just a couple of minutes ago. Um, he's a brilliant graphic artist, a dear friend, and uh, I just like to mention if anybody is uh, part of the um, um, American Philatelic Society, uh, Irv and I co-authored a large, uh, a beautiful. It's not out yet. It'll be in the uh, Hanukkah article about philatelic Hanukkah things um, in the American, um, it's called the American Philatelist Magazine. And uh, so if you do get that, take a look. Uh, the December issue will have a, uh, my partner in crime there. He's so good. He's, he's a brilliant graphic artist. And uh, uh, I thank him for all the things he does for me. <laughs> Turns around. It's amazing. Thanks, Irv. Good to see you. Questions, anybody? Cantor Stern, anything from up in New Jersey? Enjoyed it immensely. Um, just a great experience. Thank you. I had to uh, jump away for a minute, but I caught most of it. It's just absolutely fascinating. And the artwork is so beautiful, my goodness. And I had never heard of, truthfully, I never heard of this artist before. So this has been most enlightening. Thank you so much. Double There's a lot of his works available on online. And you oh can, my God. yes, there's a whole Arthur Schick the Society. Is, is um, incredible. Yeah, the uh, U.S. Holocaust Museum. We've gifted a number of things uh, to them, but they have quite a bit of stuff. And um, the Library of Congress has quite a bit too. Um, it's it's around. It's, uh, it's there's some really nice collections. I I I hate to say things like this because you never really know. But I think based on the number of original pieces of artwork we have. And, and all the other types of things, uh, his books and uh, manuscripts, uh, lithographs, stamps, and so on. We, may, we probably have one of the largest private collections of his. Um, we're trying to figure out um, where that's going to go. And, and it may all go to the U.S. Holocaust Museum at some point in time. Wonderful. The Philipson collections are just amazing how much, how much he has, both in physical collections and in knowledge in his head. We're, we're so appreciative to everything. Um, once again, I honor your veterans tomorrow, 11, 11, Please. Please. Uh, a wonderful day to honor veterans. Greg will be participating. His father was in world war two. His grandfather was in world war one. Um, Michelle's father in the Korea conflict. He's a Holocaust survivor. And, uh, yeah, we've got uh, some really deep military roots in our family. So. Beautiful. And we hope that you can join Temple Beth Torah Friday night. We have a wonderful musician, Ellie Flyer, joining us um, and lots of other things coming up. I put some information in the chat about an upcoming online Hanukkah store we're having uh, on November 15th when people are dropping off donations for Humble Area Assistance Ministries and also, uh, and also buying Hanukkah supplies. So lots of exciting things coming up and our own eternal light, the Nair Tamid Award on December 6th, honoring Hai Pen is a wonderful afternoon. It's going to include Sunday, December 6th at 3.30. It's going to include a virtual tour of the Holocaust Museum led by Hai's wife, Lynn Gordon, who is one of the finest Holocaust donuts among all wonderful. We've got lots of Holocaust donuts, docents, on the call here today. So thank you everyone for coming. Rabbi, were there any questions or do we need to jump off? I don't know if anybody had a question or not and I hate to drop off if yeah. somebody still had something. I did not see any specific, okay. specific questions. We do have another Lunch and Learn scheduled coming up I, with us a week from Thursday on the 19th. It's going to be, uh, our special guest that time is going to be Cindy Kaplan from Houston Jewish Funerals. We're going to be talking about uh, end of life issues, as well as planning and the Jewish responses and Jewish ways of both mourning and facing the, uh, facing the inevitable. So that's going to be a very interesting program and a very, uh, very important one for for everyone to think about. That's Thursday, 
November 19th at noon. And if you're on our weekly email list, you will get information. If you're not, please, uh, I'll, I'll put this in the, in the chat as well to email our administrator at admin at tbtumble.org. Lots of opportunities. We're a small synagogue. And if you enjoyed the today's presentation, we're delighted and, and just wonderfully grateful that Greg donates his time um, and the temple can certainly use support. And so feel free to come onto our website and support. Thank you, everybody. Sein gesund. Thank you, Greg.